Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's talk. I'm Nikki from the Kellogg Hubbard Library, and we're pleased to be partnering with the League of Women Voters for this series. Before I get started, I just wanted to let you know um, that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, please remain muted throughout the presentation to ensure the best experience for all participants. If you have questions, please type them into the chat and our speaker will address them. Now I'm excited to pass it over to Anna who will introduce tonight's speaker and get us started. Good evening. Welcome to the League of Women Voters United States Supreme Court series. Tonight, we're honored and fortunate to have President Rod Smoller of the Vermont Law and Graduate School to speak about presidential immunity in the United States Supreme Court case, Trump versus United States, a case he is well qualified to analyze for us. He, Professor Smoller is a nationally known author and scholar on issues of constitutional law, civil rights, freedom of speech, defamation, and privacy. He's also an active litigator, and he recently represented Dominion Voting Systems in the defamation case against Fox News Network. He and his team successfully argued that Fox News had broadcast false statements um, claiming that the Dominion's voting machines had been rigged um, to steal the election from then-President Trump. Fox News agreed to pay Dominion over $787 million and acknowledged, in fact, that they had broadcast false statements about Dominion. So we are very lucky to have him with us this evening. And without further ado, President Smola. Thank you, Anna. And thanks, Nikki. And thanks to the library and the League of Women Voters. And thanks to all of you that have taken time out of a beautiful Vermont November evening to uh, spend some time talking about these matters. Uh, so what I plan to do is uh, spend some time talking to you about the decision, but I'm gonna begin by placing it in some context. Uh, I'm gonna place it against the backdrop of where this Supreme Court is and how it's evolving and the larger picture of its influence on American culture and American politics and American law. Then I'll talk to you in some detail about the opinion. Of course, the impact of the opinion is itself colored by and impacted by the results of the election last week. So I can talk to you a little bit about the pragmatic implications of the opinion in light of um, Donald Trump's victory. And then what I'd like to do is give you a lot of time to ask me anything you want to ask me. And it can have nothing to do with the Trump versus the United States case. Uh, I'm happy to be a sounding board and to answer your questions as best I can about any issues of constitutional law that are concerning you today, um, whether or not they directly uh, concern the presidency. <clears throat> So with that, let me first place the decision that I'm talking to you about, Trump versus the United States, against the larger backdrop of where the Supreme Court of the United States is at this moment. And, and I will say that as I get into that, part of the beauty of the Internet that we have right now is we're all in our homes. You've, I've got my fire lit behind me. I've got my dog at my feet. Uh, my wife, Anya Smola, is listening in from, from the, the couch behind the fireplace. Um, and I hope all of you will feel comfortable not being afraid to type questions in the chat, even as I'm talking at the beginning, uh, as they occur to you. And then I think the only practical way to go through this is once I'm done with my opening, I'll, I'll sort of scroll through those questions and do the best I can to answer them. So I have been a constitutional law a litigator and scholar and law teacher since um, the early 1980s. So some 45 years, I think. I've taught at a dozen different law schools across the United States and, um, and been active in this arena for a long, long time. And for most of my life, as a lawyer and a scholar and, uh, and a teacher, the Supreme Court of the United States had been somewhat balanced. 
there were always a small number, two or three brilliant conservative intellectuals on the court. And there were always a small number, two or three equally brilliant uh, progressive liberal intellectuals on the court. But there were often two or three justices in the middle who tried to mediate between the two wings of the court. And on the one hand, that was not satisfying because often we'd get decisions from the court that seemed to be ambiguous or middling or a compromise. But on the other hand, it was satisfying because there was a kind of sense of balance that the decisions of the court more or less reflect, uh, reflected the larger divisions in our society, took a kind of centrist position, uh, would go back and forth a bit between liberal outcomes and conservative outcomes. It certainly made it interesting to teach. And that was most of my life as a lawyer. But then, as everyone knows, um, President Trump had the opportunity through happenstance in his first term to appoint three very bright, um, very, very competent conservative justices, uh, Justice Kavanaugh, um, Justice Gorsuch, um, and Justice Barrett. And that shifted the voting dynamics on the court. And so in the last two, three, four years, American constitutional law has taken some quite dramatic turns. It's a 6-3 majority of the conservative justices. And although they don't always vote as a block, and although the outcomes are not always on the conservative side of constitutional law, for the most part, that has been how it's worked out. So what have been the characteristics of this new court that produced the presidential immunity decision? Uh, first, it's been a very, very powerful move toward the trimming of the power of federal administrative agencies. And of course, we know from Mr. Trump's campaign, but more importantly, just from some of the people that he has appointed to his inner circle for the next, um, in the last few days, that that program of diminishing the power of the federal administrative state is going to be one of the signatures of his administration. And it has already uh, been one of the signatures of the Supreme Court. A corollary to that has been a shift of power, a shift of influence over our lives from the national government to the state government. And this is sometimes fractured. And so, for example, on issues such as abortion, um, there will be states that are very protective of reproductive rights, states that are very aggressive against reproductive rights. But the point is, whereas that was under Roe v. Wade, a national decision, it's now been evolved to a state-by-state -state set of decisions. So the world in a place like Vermont might differ dramatically from what one would see in Alabama or Texas. Uh, there's been a general move that even predated the decision in the immunity case toward resurrecting a very strong vision of the presidency. Uh, Sometimes it goes under the nickname the unified executive, but it's been the notion that this court believes the framers of the Constitution contemplated a very powerful, powerful presidency. Uh, in other arenas, this court has been very, very strongly protective of religious freedom, of the free exercise of religion. But on the other side of that coin under the First Amendment, it has dramatically watered down uh, the rules governing the establishment of religion, the separation of church and state. Uh, the court, in a very, very important, powerful decision that directly impacts my own life as an educator, um, rejected affirmative action in 
uh, in admissions to universities, but the likelihood is that that will spread throughout all sectors of our society. That had been a world we had lived in for some 40 or 50 years since the 1970s, and now um, race-conscious admissions in university admissions, but across the board in many sectors of our society is no longer permissible. Uh, more broadly, just to kind of think about the what lawyers or scholars like me might call the jurisprudence of the court, you know, that, that means legal philosophy. Uh, this new court quite strongly emphasizes the original views of the framers of constitutional provisions. So that can go back, you know, more than 200 years to the framers of the original constitution and the Bill of Rights, and then to the Civil War epoch, to those who ratified the 14th Amendment. But, but a very strong kind of uh, inclination to say, well, what would those folks 200 years ago have said about gun control? What would those folks 200 years ago have said about, or 100 years ago, have said about abortion? And that has been one of the driving thought processes. And then finally, to use a lawyerly term, I'm sure you've heard it, it's a Latin term, uh, the term is stare decisis. That's the fancy Latin word for respect for precedent. The idea that if it's been decided, it should stay. All right. Decisis and stare come together. Uh, that's never been an absolute rule. And we wouldn't want it to be an absolute rule. We want our courts to evolve to some degree. We want our courts to be able to confess that a prior decision was terrible and should be overruled. The greatest example in our history would be Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, overruling the separate but equal doctrine from the 19th century in Plessy versus Ferguson. So I'm not, and you should not be, um, a believer that once it's been decided, it is decided forever. But there is a sense that, that existing decisions deserve a fair amount of weight and a fair amount of respect. And you have to have very strong reasons for overruling them. And we have a court right now that has a very weak view of stare decisis, a, strong, a, a real willingness to revisit what a lot of folks might have thought was settled constitutional law and flip it and change it. And probably the two most dramatic examples of that would be the Dobbs decision over, overruling Roe v. Wade and the Harvard decision overruling decades of, of acceptance of affirmative action. And so now we're in this new world, and it's against that backdrop that the Supreme Court decided a series of decisions arising from the first presidency of Donald Trump. But the one I'll focus on at the beginning is Trump versus the United States. And so probably everyone here knows the background of the case, but just very, very quickly, um, the Attorney General, uh, Attorney General Garland, appointed as a special prosecutor, um, Jack Smith, to investigate matters relating to both the classified documents retention at Mar-a-Lago in Florida, uh, that, that tempest but far more profoundly, the events surrounding the insurrection on January 6th. And a federal grand jury in Washington indicted a former President Trump and others for complicity in the events of January 6th. The events that were pled in the indictment included an array of activities um, before, during, and even to some degree after January 6th. But the core, the gist was that President Trump was himself responsible for inciting and encouraging those insurrection events and for seeking illegally to, in a fraudulent way, make the false claim that the president's election 
uh, President Biden's election was a, a stolen election. And in fact, President Trump should remain in power. That case then proceeded to a trial court in the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C. I recently was in that court arguing a, a few weeks ago in a matter, and I happened to be arguing in the courtroom across the hall from federal judge Chunkin, who was the judge that was presiding over this case. She wasn't there that day, but I, I was there in front of a different federal judge. Uh, immediately, President Trump's lawyer said, we can't, you can't proceed with this prosecution because the president should enjoy absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for acts undertaken while he was president. And he was president for all of the acts described in the indictment. Everything that was he was charged with occurred while he was president, even up to the day, January 6th. Uh, the district judge rejected that, saying there is no such thing as absolute criminal immunity. There's no such thing as any criminal immunity for a president. And then the appellate court, uh, the U.S. Uh, Circuit Court for the District of Columbia, affirmed. And both of those decisions were fairly absolutist. That is to say, they, they brushed off as almost not to be taken seriously the argument that uh, there was a cr immunity from criminal prosecution for a sitting president of the United States for actions taken while president. That then led to an appeal, as everyone knew it would ultimately lead to an appeal in the Supreme Court of the United States. And I listened to that oral argument. And like many people that listened to that oral argument, I was like, oh, my goodness. Wow. These justices on the Supreme Court, at least the conservative justices, appear to be nowhere near where those two lower courts were. And they were very, very skeptical of these prosecutions. That then led to the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States, written by Chief Justice Roberts. And in that decision, there were six votes in favor of immunity, three votes, the three liberal justices, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, um, and Justice Jackson, very strongly and emotionally against the majority opinion. One interesting wrinkle, which I'll talk about a little bit, was Justice um, Amy Comey Barrett, who seems to be trying to kind of have some outreach and some uh, ability to bridge in a middle way um, where some of the liberal justices were. So she defected a little bit from the conservative majority, but basically her, 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 her principal vote still voted in favor of the immunity. So what I want to try to do now is describe exactly what the Supreme Court held You'll have to put your thinking caps on because it's a little bit dense and a little bit complicated, but I'll try to go through it and then I'll enjoy taking your questions. And so the first thing to know is that there was actually a unanimous 9-0 vote on one proposition, which someday may be important, and that is the court unanimously agreed that a president enjoys no immunity, zero immunity for unofficial acts that are not within the outer perimeter of the president's duties. This had already been clear on the civil liability side. And so the Supreme Court had already made clear on a couple of occasions that if a president is sued in, uh, for money damages in a civil case for alleged wrongdoing, the president enjoys no immunity from that civil liability if the suit is grounded in things completely disconnected from 
his or her actions as president. And the case that stands for that proposition is the case involving Paula Jones's suit against President Bill Clinton for alleged sexual harassment in the Excelsior Hotel in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, she sued for violation of her civil rights. She sued for sexual assault. Clearly, that took place before President Clinton was in office. He was governor of Arkansas. And in that case, the court said, you get no immunity just because you're president from that ongoing lawsuit, it can proceed. The courts have to take a no-conscious schedule and that sort of thing, but the case proceeds. And in the Trump decision, the Supreme Court said, the same is true for criminal matters. So if a president is accused of criminal matters that have nothing to do with his or her presidency, such as things the president did prior to becoming president, there can be no immunity. And even if as president, there were things the president did that were not official acts, were not connected to the presidency, there would be no immunity. So in Mr. Trump's case, for example, it is at least possible that his pressure on state officials, particularly his pressure on the Secretary of State of Georgia, Brad Raffensperger, were so outside of anything connected to his duties as president that they'd be deemed private acts or unofficial acts and entitled to no immunity. We don't know that. We, that we, we don't know if that's the case or not, but at least it's arguable. So on that, there was agreement. But then there was fierce disagreement over the most important aspect of the case. And that's the part that's a little bit complicated. I'll do the, the best I can to try to make it simple for you. So the court said, okay, we've ruled out any immunity for unofficial acts, but what about official acts? What about things that the president did in his or her capacity as president? And here the court created a dichotomy. It divided the world of official acts between what it called the core official acts of the president and the non-core official acts. So the Supreme Court actually used that word core. So for those of you that go to the gym and maybe you have a personal trainer, maybe the trainer says, we've got to work on your core. All right. So, you know, you know there's this idea of a core. And. And the court used that throughout the opinion, and so did the dissenters, but it had a more elegant phrase. So it used, it used the word core, but then it used a, a synonym phrase, um, which comes from another famous Supreme Court opinion in which it said, what we mean by core are those acts that are within the, quote, conclusive and preclusive powers of the president. That phrase, conclusive and preclusive, <clears throat> comes from one of my most, my most favorite Supreme Court justices, Robert Jackson. He was the prosecutor for the United States at the Nuremberg Trials, a magnificent writer. He wrote one of the most influential opinions in American history about the presidency. And believe it or not, there have been very few, but he wrote one of the handful of most important opinions. This arose from the very dramatic case in which Harry Truman ordered the steel mills seized during the Korean War to prevent and bust up a labor strike that was arguably endangering the abilities of the United States to prosecute the Korean War. And that's where that phrase comes from. It's meaning so we can use that phrase or we can use core, and I'm going to revert to core because it's a little easier. The idea is there may be certain things that a president does that are totally within the president's prerogative. Congress cannot interfere and the courts cannot interfere. Conclusive, none of your business. Preclusive, none of your business. And what the Supreme Court said in the Trump case is, if a president is being prosecuted for something at the core 
there is absolute immunity. Now you're going to wonder, what's the core? What's the core? I'm going to get to that in a minute. But before I get to that, what about if the president does something that is clearly presidential? It's 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 within the scope of his or her performance of his his or her office, but it doesn't fit the core. Then what's the rule going to be? And weirdly, I, I do not understand why, but strangely, the opinion of Chief Stuff, uh, Justice Roberts doesn't answer that question. It says we don't have to go there yet. We're gonna we're not gonna answer that right now today. But clearly, the signals in the opinion, the momentum of the opinion, seem to suggest that if it's presidential and official, but not core there would be a more qualified immunity. Uh, there would be some immunity, but it could be overcome. It could be pierced if a strong enough case was made to pierce it. We'll table that for now. We don't know what the outcome of that would be. But let's now turn to this question, okay, what's core, what's not core? And the Supreme Court here drew on some prior decisions, there have not been many, I've suggested to you that there have not been many, that described the kinds of presidential, uh, presidential actions that we would put at the core. So there were some that were easy. The most classic is the pardon power. The idea that a president in exercising the pardon power cannot be overruled by anybody, can't be overruled by Congress, can't be second-guessed by courts. Another fairly esoteric one, but fairly important uh, still, involved the president's power to recognize foreign governments or not recognize foreign governments. Uh, this came to a head during the administration of President Obama on the question of whether or not to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel for example. And the court said, Congress, you can't play a role in that. We as a court can't play a role in that. That's exclusively for presidents. Um, for our purposes right now, though, what matters most is that the court in the Trump case said, absolutely at the core is the president's superintendents over his or her subordinates who are executive branch officials that the president has the absolute right to hire and fire. And when the president is giving directions to a subordinate cabinet official in the executive branch and commits a crime in instructing the secretary of state to do something criminal, or the Secretary of Defense to do something criminal, or the Attorney General to do something criminal, the President enjoys absolute immunity. And the Supreme Court reinforced this with regard to President Trump's pressures on the Justice Department to do things like pressure states to recognize that there had been fraud or alternative electoral slates. The court reinforced it by saying, the quintessential executive function is the prosecution of crime. And although we have attorney generals and we have U.S. attorneys and we have prosecutors, at the end of the day, the president is the prosecutor in chief, just like the president is the commander in chief. And decisions involving what the Justice Department should do or not do are at the core and absolutely immune. Finally, believe it or not, I'm basically pretty close to done. Finally, in a in a in a in a technical piece of the opinion that had profound practical consequences, uh, the court said, not only is the president immune from actions the president takes at the core, but you can't use things he or she did at the core against the president in prosecutions on matters for which the president would not be immune. 
So to try to translate this for you, let's imagine that we classify some act that President Trump did as not official at all. Let's take his call to Secretary of State of Georgia, Brad Raffensperger. Let's just say, we don't know for sure, but we'll say, all right, that's not official. If you were prosecuting President Trump for that, could you introduce into evidence conversations within the Oval Office with members of the Justice Department that would shed light on his motivation when he called um, Brad Raffensperger? Normally in criminal prosecutions, yeah, you can do that kind of stuff. You can have evidence. This is why I believe the person committed the murder. This is why this was should be considered a bribe. It gives the jury a context. But the Supreme Court said here, you can't do it. You can't use evidence of stuff the president did exercising his or her core responsibilities, even if you're prosecuting for something for which there's no immunity, which could either be an unofficial act or maybe an official act that was not in the court. That's the one point where Justice Barrett defected. Justice Barrett said, that makes no sense to me. I join with the liberal justices there. I think you should be allowed to introduce that in context no matter what. Before I end, a couple other footnotes, and then I'm going to turn to the chat. So I see there's lots of fascinating questions in the chat. What would be examples of activity by a president that are official but not core? And the Supreme Court said, we're not going to figure all that out right now, but we're going to kind of talk about it a bit and give you some sense of what we're talking about. So one of the interesting things is the court said, you know, presidents do things all the time that may not be at their core, but everybody regards them as presidential. And so I got my fire behind me. You know, President Roosevelt did fireside chats. I doubt that when he was talking on the radio, you know, to tell to my grandparents and to my parents, um, you know, that that was a core exercise of the powers of the presidency, but surely it was part of his leadership role in president. And think about all the things that presidents do with other branches of government where they don't have authority. They can't fire, you know, um, a, a senator for disagreeing on something. They can't dictate policy as to what Congress will or will not enact. They can't control the Supreme Court, but they certainly can have an influential role in their leadership role. And the court said, those sorts of things, there's at least probably presumptive immunity, something like the qualified immunity that came from Richard Nixon's famous um, episodes in, in Watergate, um, but it wouldn't be absolute. So the first footnote to my footnote, the first fascinating, intriguing thing, it may never come up again in, in, in American history, but it will surely come up again when I teach constitutional law to my students, is what do you make of Donald Trump's interactions with Vice President Mike Pence in those days in which he was trying to pressure Mike Pence to basically give Mr. Trump the election and not Mr. Biden? And the Supreme Court actually went into this a bit, and it's fascinating. Because you could look at it two ways. You could say, well, you're the Veep. You're the vice president. The president's the boss. You're the number two. Whatever the president says to you, that should be core. That's just like him talking to the attorney general. And there may be aspects of that. There may be situations where the president would say to the vice president, I want you to go negotiate this deal with a foreign government. I want you to go do this task for me uh, that I've assigned to you about whatever, cancer or the border or whatever. And it might be that that would be a kind of core directive, the boss to the subordinate. But the vice president has an interesting role in our Constitution. Normally, we think of the vice president as a member of the executive branch. But there are times when the vice president is actually a member of the legislative branch. So the vice president presides over the Senate. Normally, that's a ceremonial role, and normally the president, the vice president doesn't exercise it. That's why there's a president pro tem of the Senate. 
but the vice president can cast a vote in a 50-50 tie. So if Mr. Trump nominates people for cabinet posts, and if for some reason there's a 50-50 tie, J.D. Vance would get to exercise the tie vote. In that situation, he's actually acting as a legislator and not as an executive branch official. And the suggestion in the Trump case was that when the vice president presided over the joint session of Congress to count the Electoral College votes, probably in that role, he was a member of the legislative branch, which means that those pressures exerted by President Trump against Vice President Pence were maybe only subject to qualified immunity and not full immunity. Two other footnotes. I got more footnotes than, uh, th than I should probably. Um, this is really, this next is not really a footnote. There were very, very powerful dissenting opinions by uh, the three liberal justices. And the three main, the two main authors were Justice Sotomayor and Justice Jackson. Um, and Justice Kagan joined in, in Justice Sotomayor's opinion. And they very powerfully railed against the whole idea that there should be any criminal immunity for a president of the United States. They constantly sounded the theme that this was inconsistent with the notion that no person is above the law. And they noted very powerfully that there's no textual basis for immunity. And indeed, they pointed to the impeachment clause, which says that, you know, a president may be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors, and then has a trailing clause that says, but the penalty shall not extend beyond removal from office or disqualification from office. And then it says, but nothing prevents the president later to be answerable in the courts of law, which makes one think that the text of the Constitution cuts against the idea of immunity. So they went very strongly on that. They accepted that there was already a notion that presidents enjoy immunity from civil lawsuits for the things they do within the outer perimeters of their office. But they said that shouldn't transfer over to the criminal side um, because the stakes are much, much bigger. And they gave the dramatic example, which is probably the most powerful dramatic example, uh, which if you listen to the oral argument or if you listen to the news reports about it, was what if the president were to order the assassination of a political opponent were to have the Navy SEALs go in and kill a political opponent, that under the majority decision, that would be subject to absolute immunity because the president's power as commander in chief is clearly in the core. And they said, oh my God, how can this possibly be? This is crazy. This is effectively making the president a king. Last footnote of the footnote of the footnote of the footnote. Last one. Justice Clarence Thomas joined the majority, but he also went off on his own frolic and detour, which he, he will frequently do. He, he's a very independent thinker, and he'll, he'll go to places that other justices won't always go to. And he said, I don't think that Jack Smith has any legal authority to bring this case. I don't think the attorney general should just be able to pull in some lawyer and appoint that person as a special prosecutor. There once was a federal law creating the Office of Independent Counsel. That was the law that empowered Ken Starr to go after the Clintons. But that law has expired. It doesn't exist anymore. And in Justice Thomas's view, only a full-time employee of the Justice Department acting pursuant to the Attorney General could bring the prosecution, but you can't just bring in a guest hitter uh, to come in and, and temporarily hold this office and do this. And that argument was accepted in the Mar-a-Lago case by, just, by the, the um, federal judge in Florida, um, and she threw out Jack Smith's prosecution there 
following Justice Thomas's roadmap, we'll never know whether that argument would ultimately prevail or not prevail. At least we won't know in the short term, because as a practical matter, and I'll end here, we know for sure that the federal prosecutions are over. And Jack Smith is already winding them down, basically for two reasons. One, there's a long-standing view within the Justice Department. So there's a long-standing Justice Department policy that says a, a sitting president cannot be criminally prosecuted. We don't know if that's true or false. We don't know if that's good law or bad law. That's the Justice Department's long-standing historic position, it dates back to the Nixon years. And so it would be contrary to Justice Department policy to continue the cases. But more pragmatically, since we know the president is prosecutor in chief, once President Trump comes into office, all he has to do is say to his new attorney general, drop the case. And the cases have to be dropped. There, there'd be no recourse to that. So with that, we have about 20 minutes left, and I am going to do the best I can to scroll through these questions and answer them for you. So the first question, I'll read you these questions. I'll, I'll, I'll anonymize them. I won't, I won't tell you who, 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 who asked the question. Um, how confident are you that our Constitution can be successfully defended against attempts by the Trump administration to erode its protections? Well, of course, that's, that's the question that everyone is asking. And, and I am generally confident. That is to say, I have a fair amount of faith in our system, a fair amount of faith, particularly in the federal judiciary, to say that there are lines that, if they were attempted to be crossed, um, could not be crossed. There would be there would be um, a check and balance on them. Now, I'm not naive. I'm not silly. I don't have any doubt that there may be attempts. There may be attempts at sham prosecutions. There may be attempts to um, uh, penalize people for the exercise of free speech rights, critical of the of, of the administration. There may be there may be all sorts of things that some people would think were constitutional. Some people would think were unconstitutional. I have spent my whole life litigating over those borderlines, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of that. But if you ask me at the end of the day, do I believe President Trump could retain power, notwithstanding the constitutional provision that you can only serve two terms? I'm confident the answer is no. If there were ridiculous, sham, totally meritless prosecutions um, at uh, going after political enemies, I'm confident that although those folks that were prosecuted would have to go to the hassle of hiring lawyers, although they have to um, go through the processes, that conscientious judges would, at the end of the day, dismiss frivolous prosecutions. I'll, I'll, I'll go a little more deeply. I know that part of the narrative right now is that this president-elect is surrounding himself with, with yes-men and yes-women, with people that will not stand up and say you're wrong, Mr. President, like Bill Barr did or Mike Pence did or other members of the Justice Department did at various points, even Attorney General Sessions did at some point. I get that. But I believe even those folks, there are lines that would be crossed. So let's take that horrible, horrible example of the president orders somebody killed as a political opponent. I'm just confident that you could not find an American Armed Services member that would carry out that illegal order. I, I just, I really believe they would not. Uh, conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat. Maybe you think I'm naive, but that's my faith. I have a fair amount of faith in the system. I, I preach that faith to our law students. I'm not naive. I know that there'll be a lot of bumpy times for folks that are um, uh, very much opposed to some of the things that this president is in favor of. But I do think 
the, you know, the nation will survive this, the Constitution will remain intact. We may agree or disagree over particular decisions that the courts make, but I think overall, the system will prevail. That's my view. You're entitled to your own. Next question. Um, if federal law overrules state law, how could the Supreme Court allow Texas to continue to ban their state hospitals from following uh, EMTLA law or lose federal funding, um, denying women um, reproductive rights? Why isn't it just a slam dunk? That's an awfully technical question. I'm not sure I have a great answer to it. You know, um, yes, federal law prevails over state law, um, but you have to find out whether there is, in fact, a federal law in place that supersedes it. So the Supreme Court, you may remember, um, did side with reproductive freedom rights, at least temporarily, uh, holding that certain federal laws requiring that emergency rooms provide appropriate emergency care, including care that might be necessary for a woman that needed an abortion procedure in order to uh, avoid harm to her. Um, the court has at least temporarily said um, that the state law can't be enforced. Um, but, and, and I think that principle will be, the, the, the question was, why isn't that not a slam dunk? I think that the principle is a slam dunk the harder question is going deeply into the text of the federal law to determine what it says and was it what it does not say and i think i think this conservative supreme court if it were convinced that the federal law um did supersede the state law and if it were convinced that congress had the power to pass the federal law it would it would rule in favor of the federal rule and not the state rule um, next question. You all are taking me up on my invitation to ask me about anything, no matter what, whether it has anything to do with this case or not. I got a question on Taylor Swift. I don't think I'm going to answer that, but <laughs> I'm teasing. All right. Uh, could Trump actually mandate reciprocity for open carry of guns between states, even if that is illegal in another state? No, I mean, the president of the United States does not have lawmaking power. This goes back to the steel seizure case that I mentioned. <laughs> There's always a tug of war involving the extent to which a president can exert executive power, claiming that it's either an inherent presidential power or has been delegated to the president by an act of Congress. Now, even though I said earlier today, that this is a court that has an expansive view of presidential power. There is a complication. And the complication is this court is also very much on the side of restraining administrative agencies. And the restraint on administrative agencies includes a, a series of rulings that say if the executive branch claims it has the authority from Congress to do a certain thing, you better be darn sure you can point to where that is explicitly articulated. <laughs> and so this court has been careful about not allowing loosey-goosey, that's a very technical legal term, loosey-goosey delegations of power to the executive. And it used that against President Biden in a number of instances. It overruled President Biden's attempt to cancel student debt. It overruled the decision by President Biden involving requirements of vaccination or testing during the COVID uh, crisis. Um, it, it used it in a big environmental law case to say that the Environmental Protection Agency could engage in rules that dramatically shifted uh, our policy toward clean power because Congress had not authorized that. And so, and so if this court plays it straight, some of those decisions could actually hamper efforts by President Trump to impose some of what he wants to do. 
because some of the very conservative justices he has appointed do require that you point to specific authorization from Congress uh, before you undertake certain actions. Next question. Um, what is the basis of the Supreme Court believing in the original ten of the framers? Is it based on the assumption that never, nothing new would ever come? An example for me is the fact that guns exist now that have not had lethal capabilities that would not have existed at the time. So this is this is perhaps you know one of the most ancient debates in the history of American constitutional law. And uh, on the one side are people that say um, the Supreme Court cannot rule on a matter unless there is a specific basis in the text of the Constitution justifying it. And more importantly, unless those who wrote that text would have agreed with this particular outcome. But believe it or not, both Liberals and conservatives both have never totally embraced that idea. So let me give you the ultimate conservative example. It's Trump versus the United States. Executive immunity is not in the text of the Constitution. It has been implied by the court uh, in, in the court's view of the of the structure and, and the ethos of the framers. More, more commonly in today's culture war battles that reach the Supreme Court, we deal with matters involving civil rights and civil liberties in which the question is, should a particular clause be interpreted in a way that would have been different from how the framers would have decided it, but is consistent with the principle they enacted? And so the framers believed in freedom of speech. But we may understand freedom of speech in a way different from what they could have imagined. The framers believed in the equal protection of the laws. But we may understand that in a way that is different from how they would have understood it in the 19th century. And, of course, this was the backdrop for the Dobbs case, the abortion case, in which the Supreme Court said there is no way that the folks who ratified the 14th Amendment would have believed in a right to an abortion. Of course, they wouldn't have. And that's probably accurate. Um, the contrary view is, but they did believe in a notion of privacy, even though they didn't say that. And our current conceptions of privacy ought to include something like this or same sex marriage, for example. Um, now, before you just automatically assume that the liberals are always on the living constitution side, and the conservatives are always on the more static side, which is a fair overall characterization. I do want to point out to one decision by a conservative justice that has profound implications that draws a distinction, and these are my words, these are not the justice's words, between what I'll call the, the concept and the conception. So this is actually not a constitutional law decision. This is a decision interpreting the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's from a few years ago. It's called the Bostock case. The issue is when Congress prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex, did it mean to include discrimination on the basis of sexuality and gender identity? So Title VII, prohibits employment on the basis of uh, discrimination on the basis of sex, but is that also a prohibition on whether you're gay, you're lesbian, you're transgender, and so on? And in a decision by Justice Gorsuch, one of the conservative members of the court, Justice Gorsuch said, I am sure that the members of Congress in 1964 never dreamed that they were prohibiting discrimination against gays and lesbians and transgender folks. I'm sure that's true. My goodness, it was a crime back then in 1964 to be homosexual. And they would have said, this is about discrimination between men and women. This has nothing to do with whether you're gay or straight. That's a whole different ballgame. But Justice Gorsuch said, maybe that was what was in their brain. Maybe that was, maybe that was their, um, their conception. 
But what's the concept that they created? And the concept, he says, is all sexual orientation discrimination is automatically sex discrimination. And he gave a very simple illustration. He basically said, let's imagine two workers. And I'm going to make up the names. I can't remember what, what exactly he used. But let's imagine two workers, Mary and John, a woman and a man. And let's imagine they are both married, and they're both married to a man. They're both married to Peter. Mary is married to Peter. John is married to Peter. John's going to be fired because he's a man married to a man. Mary's not going to be fired because she's a woman married to a man. You're treating the male and the female employee differently. That's discrimination on the basis of sex, and that's illegal. I happen to think that's a great opinion. I happen to think it's a um, very thoughtful, emancipated opinion by a conservative justice. And I went into this long spiel to say that um, this debate on how much we pay attention to the original views of the framers, how much we allow it to grow, has some wiggle room, has some intellectually sound, you know, basis for uh, understanding that we may understood thing, we may understand things that you created. You didn't know what you were creating, but we see it better than you do now, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna enforce that. So, you asked me. Somebody asked me earlier, do I have faith in our constitutional system? You know, this is one of the reasons I do. You can still have a surprise where where a conservative justice will surprise you with a very um, progressive opinion. Next question. Gosh, finally, I get a question based on presidential immunity. Uh, did the I'm just teasing, folks. Did the court cite any textual basis in the Constitution for the immunity decision? So this is we're coming up on the end. This is this is sort of the um, this is probably the last question I'll have a chance to take. There, there is no text that says the president of the United States is immune from criminal prosecution. There is none. The dissenters, the liberal justices said, aha, I gotcha. You're making this up. It's not in there. The conservative justices said, and I have to say, I think this is fair. Well, come on. We, we often imply things in the Constitution. We often imply things involving separation of powers in the Constitution. We do that for this court's powers. We do that for the president's powers. We do that for the powers of Congress. And in fact, when I teach constitutional law, I point out to the students the most awesome power that the Supreme Court holds, which is the power to declare acts unconstitutional if they are repugnant to the Constitution, does not appear anywhere in the text of the Constitution. It's, it's, it's an implied power that dates back to John Marshall's famous decision of Marbury versus Madison. So the idea that you can imply things that are not there, literally, I'm very comfortable with, that's part of our const constitutional um, tradition. To me, the brain teaser, and I'll end with this, goes back to something I mentioned earlier, that we do have this provision in the Constitution, the impeachment clause, which says that if you are impeached and convicted, all that can happen to you is removal or disqualification from office. You can't be, you can't be sent to jail by the Congress. Mr. Trump argued, aha, that means that, that I can't be sent to jail because I was impeached, I was acquitted. The only people that could ever be sent to jail would be somebody that was convicted. I wasn't convicted. Therefore, someone who was impeached but let off the hook can never be prosecuted. All nine justices rejected that argument. They said, no, come on, come on, come on. You're overreading that. The only point of that provision 
was that the framers of our constitution wanted to break from England where the English parliament could not only impeach you, but send you to death. Not only impeach you, but send you to prison. We didn't want legislative bodies effectively acting as courts. They said, that's all it means. I'll end with this. The liberals said, well, okay, we rest our case. What it's got to mean is that the only text we have clearly contemplated that outside of the impeachment process, the president could be criminally prosecuted. For the reasons I've already explained, the majority didn't accept that. And Anna, I think I should let you adjourn the proceedings officially. It's 8.01. If you have any closing remarks, let me just say thanks to the League of Women Voters and to the library. It's been my pleasure to be with you. And I'll turn it over to our congenial host. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. I imagine that we will get continue to hear, you know, discussion and questions as the days go on. So I want to thank you for that. And <clears throat> yes, now I want to come and listen to your constitutional <laughs> law class. I hope you feel free to email me if you have questions. I'm easy to find at Vermont Law and Graduate School. I'll be happy to, to, to answer questions if you have them down the road. Okay, thank you all for attending. I hope you learned a lot. I certainly did. And thank you very much, President Paula. Good night. Thank you all take care. Have a good evening, everybody.